for that introduction. I've never been described as part of the Ant and Deck team. Am I Ant or Deck, I wonder? Um, I'm here this evening along with Oliver O'Grady uh, to really update you on the Living Lomans Landscape Partnership Program. This is another one of these heritage lottery funded programs uh, focusing on, on landscape. And we have just started into year three of delivery. But for me, all of this started about five years ago when we started to develop plans. And what I want to do really with Oliver today is to tell you about what we've been up to on the archaeological front uh, in year two. But very briefly, for those who weren't here two years ago, when I described uh, the Living Lomans Partnership, uh, we are a, a partnership of organizations led by the Fife Coast and Countryside Trust as the lead organization, uh, with other groups, uh, including the Falcon Stewardship Council, uh, Mark Inch Heritage Group, uh, I represent on the board uh, Kinross Museum, because our project straddles uh, Fife and Kinross. The, the Lomond Hills title really covers not just the Lomond Hills proper, but that area of the regional park to the south, covering uh, Benarty and part of uh, the Loch Ower area. But the project that I'm going to be focusing on is our search for boundary stones, and if you want to find stones, interesting stones that uh, tell you about boundaries, head for the Lomond Hills, because you will be tripping over them wherever you go. And our project really developed out of work that I started uh, at an earlier period. Uh, but a little bit more about the landscape projects. We have a whole variety of uh, theme headings, ranging from uh, the natural heritage to the cultural heritage, access, education, community engagement, and the historic landscape. I'm the theme lead for the historic landscape projects. In all, there are about 30 projects in the partnership program, of which about half a dozen are historical. And these are the areas that we have focused on. Uh, a bit of geology, uh, discover ancient lomans, which is the archeological element of the program, as well as restoring and revealing uh, other important structures from Bokor Castle to Mark Inch Church uh, and, and uh, the Temple of Decision, uh, created by the Bruces above Falkland and the famous Tyndall Bruce Monument built in the 1850s, busy being restored. The archaeological program, uh, Discover the Ancient Lomans, uh, is now in its third year, but, and we're here to tell you about year two. Uh, this is led by uh, Oliver O'Grady, archaeologist, uh, who we see here in action on, a, on a, a very pleasant May day, I think not. Uh, and, our role here with Discover the Ancient Lomans is to undertake uh, archaeological fieldwork, uh, but engage with the community and train people uh, uh, as volunteers in what archaeology is about, what fieldwork is, is, is about. So in year one, we did quite a bit of uh, uh, field walking and geophysics, uh, and the volunteer program has developed quite considerably. So we have a really good body of volunteers who come out as soon as they hear that we have a program uh, in hand. Now, I'm going to talk about uh, one of the projects we looked at earlier in the year, and this is our search for boundary stones. We were looking so, for some very specific ones related to the uh, community of the, Fol uh, the Lomond Hills of Falkland. But there are many, many stones in the Lomond Hills to do with boundaries. For example, uh, contested boundaries. And here we have a boundary that stretches up um, from the valley of the River Leven up into the Bishop Hill. And on the left, we have a map showing a whole array of names taken for a perambulation of this disputed boundary between uh, the Bishop of St. Andrew's lands in the Bishopshire and the estate of Arnott. And this is 1389 when this perambulation took place. Uh, and this was a disputed boundary right up into the 18th century. And on the right, we have a photograph of one of the boundary stones with a B for Bishopshire and an F for the farm of Fale. Uh, on the back of it. So here's a, a, a contested boundary full of interesting names and boundary stones as well. But that's a whole other story. We're talking about boundary stones created as the result of the division of commenty. And in Scottish law, we have a variety of different types of common land. And commenty in particular, and much of Scotland was at one time commenty, is land owned by a, a variety of several proprietors but there's rights of servitude to others for things like grazing livestock, uh, getting stone, cutting peat and digging turf, and, and so on. In the Lomond Hills, which is sliced in half between Fife and Kinross, we have two major commentaries. 
there's first of all the, uh, the commentary of the Bishop Hill, uh, which we see up, up on top. Uh, this is in Kinroshka, uh, a smaller area than the one that we're looking at down in the right-hand corner, which is the commentary of the Lomond Hills of Falkland, which is over double the size uh, of um, uh, the Bishop Hill commentary in, in Kinroshka. Um, having explained what committees were, um, we come to a time, the Agricultural Revolution, when the division of committees was very much to the fore as one of the arms of improvement. And in 1695, there were two acts passed for modernizing farming. One, the division of runnery, that's the medieval crop lands, and two, the division of the committees to enable enclosure and the improvement of uh, the open hill and improves productivity. But you can see from this text that an exclusion from this act is lands that were owned by the king or royal boroughs. And that creates quite a difference between uh, the Kenrosha Committee and the Fife Committee of the Falklands. In 1729, we have, uh, as, as I explored uh, a year or two ago, a division of the Bishop Hill Committee. There's increased pressure from livestock, and it was decided to take advantage of the 1695 Act to divide the hill up and give each of these townships from Kiniston in the south through Kineswood, Balnethel, Bulgaria, Palmyo, Pindreek, their share of the forebray and the backbray of the Bishop Hill. And this was undertaken by an overseer or oversman uh, who employed one or two local landowners as arbiters, and they also employed a surveyor to draw the map and plot where boundary stones might be laid. And that's how the division was allocated depending on the amount of land they had in the, the lowlands. And we're now seeing this new body of people appearing in the landscape called fewers or portioners. And they actually had title to the land, and we see fewers appearing in Kinrosha from the late uh, 17th century onwards. And so apart from the major landowners, these people too are entitled to their share of the community when it's divided. And here's the uh, land surveyor allocating, uh, or drawing out the various shares, and what we see in the landscape are uh, boundary stones, just natural stones that were put in the hill. The dikes have emerged later, may have appeared later. Uh, and you have some quite interesting ones. Here is uh, the Riven Stone, obvious why it's got its name. Uh, sliced in two, piece of quartz dolerite marking the boundary between the forebrae and the backbrae of the Bishop Hill, but also the boundary between the Kineswood and the, the Walnetho sections of the 1729 division. And there it is marked on a map drawn by John Burrell in 17. 96 for a later division that took place. There was a second tier of divisions, each township having been given its share of the committee in 1729, they later divided them up yet again amongst the various viewers of each of these settlements. And this is the Balgeri uh, division represented on a map drawn on parchment by John Burrell, parchment maker in Kinesola. And you can actually plot where these places were on the map. Uh, you can see, for example, uh, the shares owned by uh, farms at the foot of the Bishop Hill, and also from further afield, Palmyl and Preton Greek. So how did they get their cattle there? Uh, well, they came up a common loan, which led them into Glenvale and round to their portions. That's why if you go up Glenvale, there is a track on either, oops, either side of uh, either side of the uh, of the Glen, Glen Burn there, Glenvale Burn. This is Kinroshire, giving access to Pogmok and Palmyl. And this is the, the Fife uh, Committee, the Committee of the Lomond Hills of Falkland. And how did the committee arise here? Because this was royal land at one time. And we discovered that in uh, 1605, decision of the Scottish Parliament at the instance of the king, that this, should be, this, this land should be dissolved and given to people that can pay him enough money. In other words, he's going to get some income. And that's really when the committee comes into being with major land owners. There is no division of committee then under the 1695 that is possible. So while everyone else is merrily dividing up, as in the Bishop Hill, nothing happens in the Falkland side until Sir John Sinclair, who uh, was the man that instigated the old statistical account, was doing his survey for the Board of Agriculture and Industrial Improvement in 1814. He says, why on earth have they not divided up the Lomond Hills? This must be done. Look at the impossible increase in value from about one and threepence per acre to about 50 guineas an acre. That's the potential. And of course, they straight off went off to get an Act of Parliament, which was passed in 1815, only a year later. 
And this act of Parliament initiated the division of the Lomond Hills of Falkland Comity, and a commissioner was appointed in the form of the distinguished Sir William Ray advocate, and he appointed the land surveyor Alexander Martin from Cooper. And we have the benefit of documents and maps, as we had with the Bishop Hill Comity. Here is a paper copy of the uh, 1815 uh, process that was eventually completed in 1818 by Alexander Martin. That's uh, the property of the Falkland Society. And here, a, a, a much larger working copy, which is the property of Kinross uh, Marshall Museum at the moment. Full of useful information to help guide us towards the boundary stones that were eventually laid down by Alexander Martin and indicated on his plan. Here we can see, for example, numbers. These are the numbers of the stones uh, laid down right around the perimeter of the commentary. And the stones we are talking about look like this. Uh, some of you may have seen them uh, occasionally while walking in the Lomans. They have WR 1818 written on the top of them. William Ray 1818, this is the division of commentary. And they're very finely chiseled stones. Uh, look at these, uh, the work on the sides. We have cuboid ones and we have rectangular ones. Uh, these have been misinterpreted by a number of historians in the past, as for example, I think it was Snoddy who called this woods replanted in 1818. Well, there aren't many woods on, on that particular site. So what William Ray initiated was first of all, as I've shown, mark the, the whole boundary of the community, 57 stones. Secondly, mark out all the limestone quarries, for example, Wilkie's quarry behind West Lomond, and uh, there are four stones. Here are three of them that we, we discovered on our initial foray. Some of them quite, quite tricky to, to find, quite hidden. Uh, another quarry, the East Law Quarry, several more stones, at least a dozen stones here. And we can see a boundary stone, and there's the later lime works that was developed around the quarry. And finally, the third limestone quarry, the Long Cray Cairn, four stones marked that out. Having marked out the quarries, they marked out all the routeways uh, that connected not only with the quarries, but also with the various divisions that were about to be laid out. And we find the easiest ones to find sometimes are right beside uh, the roadside. This is the one that's most often seen on the way up to the summit of West Loma. And if we look at an old Northern Survey map, we can see stones marked, and uh, this is telling you that you're entering a, a new stretch of the road, and here is the prescribed 20-foot uh, divide. That's why you have rectangular ones here. But there's no obvious road, and that's because after the stones were laid, they discovered a better route. A document from Fife Council Archives helps us with each of the individual divisions that were now allocated to uh, uh, all the various potential shareholders. And there were 83 shares divided out uh, uh, across the hillside. And here's part of the map to show you that some of them were for larger landowners, like General Moncrief of Falkland and Johnson of Lathrisk. But you have lots of minuscule uh, strips being handed out to all these new feuars or portioners who have appeared in the landscape and they all have, they all get their share. You have groups of people. The club is actually a grouping of 39 people getting their share of the hill. Now obviously these shares were very difficult to manage and the question arises what happened to them? Obviously many were amalgamated, uh, quarries were opened up, little hill farms were opened like sea farm whose ruins still stand. And you could find, in, a, in the midst of all these little narrow strips, dozens and dozens of these rectangular boundary markers with the date and WR on them. And you'll find them on the hills now, often partially hidden within the new dikes that were built, sometimes broken up, uh, occasionally rather difficult to find. And the only way we can find these is because we're, we've got the maps in hand. And we know there should be a stone about here somewhere, and occasionally you have to ferret in there amongst them. Sometimes they've been moved, Here's a bit of one that's found its way into the dike. And that's why it's handy to have a number of eagle-eyed volunteers on these surveys regarding all these stones. There's the risk of damage, removal. Here's some recent damage. Somebody has uh, been at this stone, possibly with a view to, to, to taking it away. It's, it's broken. So there are lots of risks attached. And in our survey work, not only just identifying where all the stones are, but also recording their condition and what risk uh, they are in. And we fill in our survey forms with the giving each one a number, a location, a, a condition from one in really good shape to, uh, to five uh, at serious risk. 
and we also describe which shares on the division of commodity these stones refer to. Are they referring to a quarry, a road, or a share being allocated? And ultimately, hopefully next year, we will be able to do some conservation work on some of the key ones that uh, we have identified. But at the end of the day, I think we've discovered a huge body of stones. We discovered 134 boundary stones, all beautifully made. Uh, and this is a considerable body. This is, I haven't come across a comedy anywhere else in Scotland with so many stones. And we think we've only found about 60% of them. So here we have a, a potentially significant national collection that is totally unrecorded, unscheduled, and therefore worth exploring. It not only tells us that these stones are there, but it also records a very important episode in the changing land use history of the Lowland Hills that happened exactly 200 years ago. I'm now going to hand over very quickly to uh, uh, Oliver to complete the story, taking us on to the big dig.